I run. Uh, all right, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Popped up a dialogue for me. Um, I run Site District and we're a managed WordPress hosting. We've been hosting sites for about nine years now. Uh, Mark Benzikane is also joined the Zoom here. Um, he, he also works with Site District. Um, and we specialize in performance and security and features and especially support and some other things. Um, interesting that David highlighted the uh, pricing widget on the front page. Uh, yeah, it's cool. You can slide the sliders. I think the, the coolest thing with the our pricing is that we're one of the few hosts that where it's uh it's very flexible. You just sign up for it and you kind of get charged based on how many sites you host. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about plans. You don't have to change, jump up to another tier. You never pay for a bunch of extra space you're not using, that kind of thing. So it's kind of a, a set it and forget it thing, which works well for both customers and for, for us because we don't need to worry about what plan people are on either. So um, but anyway, back to the security. Um so I've given a bunch of presentations at meetups and WordCamps before. Uh, however, they've all been about performance, WordPress performance before. So this is the first time I'll be talking about security. Um, I've outlined or you know, I've proposed it or uh, about talking about security before. It's definitely a topic I, I feel like I know pretty well, but this will be the first time actually giving a talk. And so with that, I slapped together some slides this afternoon, starting this afternoon for about two hours. So everything's fresh and new and it'll be kind of casual feel free to jump in the chat or even interrupt me if you have a question or you notice i left something out or misspelled something or need a correction or anything like that because this is definitely going to be a very much a first pass tonight uh, with everything i did, didn't even rehearse it yet but hopefully the the slides are good so i'll go ahead and uh share my screen and continue on that way and make sure i get the right window all right Hopefully everyone can see this. Uh, there's a link there. I'll try to leave this page up for a minute too. If you want to load up the slides and follow along at your own speed, uh, you can do that bit.ly link there in yellow at the bottom, bit.ly slash WPSEC23. Um, and so I titled this talk, WordPress Security, and then Preventing Bad Things is the subtitle. <laughs> So I thought that was a fun way to talk uh, talk about it, and you'll you'll see that kind of highlighted throughout the slide as we go. So, all right, um, I'll go ahead and get started then. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Arizona, uh, so I spent the first eighteen years of my life actually more because um, I went then and studied at the University of Arizona in uh, in Tucson. I studied computer engineering. Uh, got a degree there. Um, then I went to work at uh, AMD and um, David and I actually had a little chat about our overlapping um, <laughs> paths working with uh, semiconductors. So I was on the design team for the first 64-bit uh, processor that AMD produced, and that was pretty cool. Uh, after working there for a couple of years, I left that job and I went backpacking and I traveled around the world for a uh, Ended up being on the road three and a half years. Um, forget how many countries I visited, but it was a long time. And I think I, I travel quite a bit, and I think I'm up around 80 countries right now. So if anyone wants to talk world travel, uh, I'm definitely into that. Um, after I finished that trip, I came back, and kind of during that trip, I started to teach my I could I couldn't do chip design while I'm traveling on the road and backpacking all over. So I'm like, what can I do? And I started teaching myself. Um, PHP and MySQL and web development, creating web pages, stuff like that. And after I came back, uh, someone contacted me looking for, they had a, they needed help with something. And I happened to be with a WordPress backend and a lot, with a WordPress plugin and a, a service, a real estate related service that ran on the backend. So that's how I got into WordPress. I took a look at it. And I was like, well, I looked at WordPress. I looked at the WordPress code. I was like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> that was my first reaction. I was like, I could do this. Um, so. I um, helped them out and uh, got busy with that for a little while, um, but then I moved on to another project, but then that client came back to me uh, a couple of years later and was saying they're having issues with uh, hosting with performance and security and they were thinking about adding another server. They had three physical servers they were maintaining and I took a look at it and uh, I said, no, 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 you, you, you don't need more servers. You need less. You just need to configure them properly. Um, and so that's actually how Site District was born. Um, I spun up a server on uh, Amazon and 
Um, it's since grown to many more servers uh, to solve their performance and, and security problems. Um, and then after a couple of years of hosting, just just uh, some pretty large customers, then uh, I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. I should um, bring this to more people. And so that's, you know, so been growing site district ever since. So that was a long about me slide, but that's that. All right. So what is security? Just kind of generalizing. I'm not even going to throw in WordPress in that sentence yet. So um, I went ahead and Googled it like all smart people do, right? Um, so security. And I, I chopped off this definition and I thought it was a pretty good one. Um, the state of being free from danger or threat. Um, so when I kind of summarize that, and this is where my title from the my uh, this presentation came from, uh, it's reducing the risk of bad things happening. So let's talk more about bad things and in the content context of WordPress security. All right, all about bad things. I thought there was going to be another slide in there, but what kind of bad things? What are the dangers? All right, well, I've come up with a, a few different categories, very high level categories. And part of this talk and the idea with it is to get you to think differently about it's a very high level talk in a lot of ways, and I'm barely scratching the surface of security and, and not getting very technical at all. But so I'm trying to, I hope to help people think a little bit about security in a little bit different way. So really the number of bad things that can happen are, are pretty limited. Um, and most things fall under one of these classes. And if I'm wrong or if I'm missing something, let me know, but disclosure. So what does that mean? It pretty much means information leaking and being exposed to people that should not have access to it. So that's one kind of bad thing. Performance uh, availability issues. So that means, you know, and that usually happens when, how does that happen? Well, it's um, maybe bad code gets into your site because someone hacked it or a lot of traffic hits the site, but it basically means the site slows down for some reason, becomes less available, maybe even goes down completely. So that's another class of a bad thing. Uh, then we have alteration and modification. So that means something gets changed that shouldn't be, very simply put. Um, so that could be your content or the functionality of the website. Someone could add, they could delete from it. They could modify what's on the site, do damage to it in some way. Um, a lot of things can, can fall under this category. Um, even gaining additional permissions is a way of having modified the site because usually someone will add a user with, the, they'll change the users on the site and give one of them more permission than they should have. So then they can alteration. And that can all, of course then lead to other issues like the other two above performance availability issues if they add malware to the site or you know they could grab your email list so you have a disclosure issue too cost inflation uh, in some cases if extra traffic gets sent to your site because someone hacked it um, or someone's abusing it another way another bad thing is your band if you you get charged for bandwidth costs could go up for that same with uh, other types of usage and finally theft and this one um i'm speaking mostly of when i say theft I, this is i consider this different from disclosure um theft i can i put in here as a category as like a physical theft and this rarely applies to websites and most people I think the only way this would really happen if someone broke into your data center and stole your servers and ran off with them. Otherwise, it's not a typical thing, but that's another kind of bad thing that can happen when we talk about security. All right, so moving on, getting a little more specific about bad things and how do they happen or apply or um, appear with WordPress sites. Um, and all of these should fall under one of these categories or multiple categories in the, you know, uh, from that previous slide. So malicious redirects. Sometimes a site will be hacked. And when you try to go to visit it, you don't stay on the site. You get kicked off, possibly bouncing off through multiple sites off to some other site that holds some kind of spam content, pornography, gambling, pharmaceuticals, you name it. 
Um, so someone will go to your website, but they'll be sent somewhere else. Spam pages. Uh, if a site gets hacked, uh, sometimes the hackers will put up a bunch of content directly on your domain. So it will show up on your domain and they'll then try to get Google to search it and index it. So you will have, maybe they'll be trying to resell Gucci bags and sunglasses off your site, off a bunch of pages on there. I've seen stuff like that happen. Spam comments. These are kind of just annoying more than anything else. But if you've got a blog, WordPress blog and you post on it and you let people comment, then there'll be, there's bound to be someone that comes along and more often a bot that comes along and tries to post something and they're saying, oh, I really like your website. Here's a URL to mine, kind of trying to generate traffic off to theirs. Um, you can have spam form submissions where you've got a contact form and you've got people, rather than posting something that your visitors will see, they direct it right at you, the site owner. Like, hey, I noticed your website looks okay, but uh, maybe I can help it with some SEO or something like that. See that stuff a lot. Um, if you run a WooCommerce or e-commerce site, you could have fraudulent orders come through or people testing credit card numbers uh, through your site. Um, people could, a hacker could inject a back door and that's really just gives them access to do more bad things more than anything else. Um, uh, they could try to ransom your site in some way. So they could both grab your data and then make it impossible for you to access, either delete it again by taking a copy of it and moving it elsewhere. Um, they could take down your site and that could be in a number of ways. Um, this is one of those that doesn't necessarily mean they get elevated access into the site. They could just send enough traffic to it that the site can't handle it and it goes down. Uh, but then sometimes if they do hack your site, then they could get code in there that would also cause it to be slow or just completely go down. Um, and they could turn your site into something that maybe doesn't just host spam pages, but actual malware that could spread and go elsewhere too. So I'm mm -hmm. sure there's probably a few more, but I think I uh, covered them pretty well. In fact, actually, if anyone wants to speak up, let me know if I missed a big one here. I'll just pause for a sec. Anyone? Think of something bad that's happened to either their site or someone else's site they know, or just something obvious you think I missed here. All right. Either I did a good job or everyone's shy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you covered all of the things that I'm thinking. I know I know I've seen malicious redirects on like some of my own sites and and um, you know, spam comments and and of course form submissions and that kind of stuff. But yeah. Okay. Thanks, yep. David. Yep. They're like they're like process processing power like malicious things that happen. They like try to run uh oh did i you site? know what i think i forgot to click the button one more time <laughs> so uh i had one more bullet point on there <laughs> forgot to be a member of a botnet so someone could take over your site and yeah basically have to do other stuff um i guess i could have put a bullet point on there for cryptocurrency mining or something like that someone might take over your site and then have it use all the cpu power they can get from the machine where it's hosted to mine cryptocurrency or do mm. something else so is that that's another good example all right i'll go ahead and move on so those are all examples of bad things but how do they happen in the first place well very simply put someone does something that causes the system to do something undesired um so I'll expand on the, that a little bit, but just uh, it's really about kind of expectations and and the way security is handled is by you know figuring out all those things the way people the all all the ways in which the bad actors are are trying to do things that maybe you did not anticipate and would have a bad effect. So it's kind of kind of countering this. How do bad things happen continued? All right, so vulnerabilities, which is basically software bugs, means there's a someone there's an error in the code. 
someone's code that runs on typically on uh, with WordPress sites. This often means on the site itself, which would be either in the WordPress core, which is not very um, often in the theme or most often in a, uh, in a WordPress plugin that you've installed. There'll be a bug in there that will allow someone to do something, as I said in the last slide, I think I could back up to it, to do something undesired. <laughs> so something unintended, uh, which will give them access or let them do any of those things that I listed on the previous slide. And another way is um, not necessarily a bug, but traffic not being blocked or filtered or, or uh, you know, res restricted from access, you know, not being able to say this traffic is bad, it shouldn't even hit the site. Um, and so, and that's definitely the case for stuff like spam comments and form submissions coming into the site. That's, it's not a bug. There's not an error on the site. People are supposed to be able to go to your contact form. They're supposed to be able to leave a comment on your blog. You just don't want bots and bad guys and spammers doing it. So that was it on that. All right, how do they happen to WordPress sites more specifically? Um, let's see. So uh, in some cases, and I actually know less about this, but if someone hacks into your hosting account at a higher level than the site itself and can get in kind of, let's say through the side, then uh, they can compromise your site in that way, then you can be hacked in that fashion. Um, I didn't list uh, password compromises, but that should be added on here. If uh, you misplace your comp uh, your password or you use a common password or someone gets into your email, you, you know, a lot of password resets and security is actually only as strong as your email is. So if you, your password gets out somewhere else and someone can get in that way, I've seen that happen. Uh, we have server level vulnerabilities where this is stuff that sits above WordPress. It's not really PHP related. It's not WordPress itself, but, um, and this is less, less common. Uh, but then the easily the most common way that bad things happen to WordPress sites is through traffic, HTTP traffic. So, which comes from browsers or bots. And those usually seek to either exploit a vulnerability, which we said in the last slide is some kind of bug that lets you do something that's not supposed to happen, or um, overwhelms the server in some other way or sends spam content, that kind of thing. So that's, that's a quick summary of how things happen. I might've missed something there. Anyone want to speak up or uh, is there something I missed under this umbrella? anyone all right I, I don't know if you were going to cover it but like you know account access i assume that mean you know one one type of account access would be a brute force attack so okay. that that's not what i was considering um oh okay because for when i'm in an account access i mean someone gets into your hosting account maybe that's how they oh. got into the hosting oh. account but rather like the account that sits above wordpress Brute force attacks are very common on WordPress sites, but I that would fall under the HTTP and traffic because that's that's how right. they hit the site. They uh -huh. don't kind of go in through the side or some other way. And and do you have any stats on how common each of these are? Is it, what, is there one of them that's that's more common than the others? Um. I definitely have a lot of data and some stats, and I actually have some slides later that cover some okay. of the stuff. So I think some of that will be answered. But if I were to just give a general uh, answer to that question, I did rank it in least occurring to most occurring. So, and as I mentioned, kind of while I was going through the slide, that the biggest reason issues show up on WordPress sites are someone sends bad traffic to the site. And so either there's a vulnerability that's they hack because that request is not blocked and they are able to exploit it, or they just send enough traffic to the site that the site is overwhelmed and ha either goes down or has performance issues, stuff like that. So yeah. by far that that happens more frequently than, than the, uh, the first two issues. Okay. And more, more common than, you know, your password leaking somehow, so. All right, uh, any 
discussion about security would be incomplete, I think, um, or negligent <laughs> without discussing risk a little bit. And so security is really all about risk. And so what is risk? It's really the probability of, as I said, something bad happening. Um, and as well as the severity of the impact if it happens, that's a, that's a big factor there too. So there are all kinds of things that could happen to websites. So one security risk for my website might be that a meteor falls from space and hits the data center where it's hosted. Now, it's possible. Should I do something about it? How big is the risk? So um, there's all kinds of possibilities of things that could happen to your website. Um, and the naive approach is to treat them equally. And really, you need to think more about risk. And addressing risk must be prioritized. And that's based on those two factors above, the probability of it happening and how severe of the impact if it does happen. So the best providers, practitioners that work with security are gonna focus on what actually matters and they'll waste, they won't waste time on low risk scenarios and stuff like that, which kind of leads me to my next point is following best practices on security is kind of lazy. Uh, it's uninformed and really just ignores thinking about it and proper consideration of risk. So. Um, be wary of best practices, and that goes for performance too, but that's another topic. All right, let's talk about preventing bad things. So first, uh, a note about security philosophy, at least this is kind of my philosophy about security, is ideally it should be invisible to the good guys. No one should notice it. That means like user experience should not be altered or degraded for valid users. So you shouldn't have to do a math problem to log into your site. You shouldn't have to remember a funky URL that you changed to your login to. Shouldn't have to do click a bunch of pictures of railroad tracks um, or lamp posts or street lights or whatever they're on these days. Um, you shouldn't be blocked while just doing normal things just because maybe you're on, maybe you're on a security site and you included some words that might flag a firewall when they shouldn't, stuff like that. So um, so again, really this one, anytime I see a site that has something that makes a user jump through extra hoops, captures are a great example. I just feel like it, like to me, you're they're doing it wrong. So there's there's definitely trade-offs with security, but if at all possible, you want you don't want the good guys to be burdened or noticed. Um, you only want the bad guys to be stopped. So how about <clears throat> with WordPress? Let's cover some basics with uh, security when it comes to WordPress. So password protection and complexity. Uh, let's see. And I guess I'll explain these as I go. So kind of obvious, just make sure your password's not too simple. Um, that's an important one. I think I'll talk more about that on another site. HTTPS, which at this point, you should have a certificate on your site and there should be no way to access it through without HTTPS. It should redirect over to that. And if you don't yet, come come talk to me <laughs> or something. Talk to anyone. <laughs> um, you definitely want to have HTTPS on your site. That just means that uh, the traffic between your browser and the server is going to be encrypted and that people can't snoop on it, which is not a common thing, but um, in some scenarios, uh, public networks, Wi-Fi, that could be a risk. Although most sites these days do use HTTPS as they should. Um, hosting provider, make sure this one is really almost impossible to judge. Really all we have is kind of news articles about which hosting providers screwed up. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really hard to know whether your provider is taking really good care of making sure their accounts at you know within a hosting are secure and that and that those aren't being hacked or compromised. So we hear reports about places that didn't do that, of course, but you're you're kind of left guessing and hoping on that. But you know, uh, if you if it seems like your provider has a decent reputation, then hopefully that's true. Um, site isolation. I'll talk more about that on another slide, but you know, sites should not be able to tamper with other sites. That's a big problem. 
Um, you could have one site that's decently secured, but if the other one has access to it and it's not, then neither of them are secure. Backup and restore. Um, if something goes wrong and you do get hacked, if someone gets into the site, changes something on it, then you want to have a backup for two reasons, and I'll cover that in a bit. But you know, um, you want to be able to get back to, or at least see where your site was before someone messed with it. A firewall. So, and this an HTTP firewall, something that sits in front of your site and filters traffic. And I'll talk a lot more about this uh, in a few slides, but you want to have some type of firewall that is filtering out that traffic to the site because as I said and as you know answered David, the biggest issue with WordPress sites is easily that traffic that's hitting the site. So a firewall is how you filter that. Uh, vulnerability patching. Um, so if there is a bug with a plugin or you've got uh, a vulnerability on the website, then that you need to get that fixed in some way. Um, and that's either by up, updating the plugin, assuming that the author has fixed the, the bug, um, or some providers of power firewalls. Uh, we do this too. We'll hot patch the firewall so that that even though the code underneath has a vulnerability, the person from the outside cannot exploit it. They can't use it. And, and they, so it becomes useless to them. So this is just kind of a, there's probably more too. And here's another slide I'll pause quickly. Uh, are there any things people would consider basics to WordPress security that they think I've missed? Don't be shy. That can't I have be a question a, about one of the things. Yes. Uh, how, how do firewalls know what traffic to keep out? I, I'll answer that with the coming slides. Okay, okay. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, I'll continue again. All right. So this is going into a little bit more depth about some of that stuff I mentioned quickly. So password protection security, your username doesn't matter. Even admin is fine. Um, so some people, this is a, they're like, no, don't use admin. Well, I'll tell you a very easy example why your username doesn't matter. Uh, how do we communicate on the web? Well, many ways, but one of them is email. What's your email address? It's your username. That's public. It doesn't matter. What matters is your password. So that's just a, a myth busting bullet point there. Your password though should be decently complex, hard to guess. Uh, don't just substitute your O's for zeros and your I's for one with ones and stuff like that too, because bot how to do that too. Uh, avoid reusing passwords across sites. And that's because if uh, one site doesn't happen to store your password securely or they get hacked in the list of hashed, encrypted, whatever passwords is stolen and the attacker happens to be able to decrypt that, uh, they can get your password and then use it on your other site. So even if your WordPress site is not hacked or secure, if you use that password somewhere else, it's a possibility that uh, someone could get it elsewhere. So, you know, one obvious solution for this is use a password manager and hopefully that is also secure. All right, site, what does this mean? This means sites, including any copies of your site, a staging copy, anything like that, they should not have access to each other. And what does that mean? No file access. You shouldn't be able to, to install like a file manager plugin or write some PHP code that can go read, alter, or do anything with the files on another, uh, another copy of the site or on another site completely. Um, ideally, uh, you limit network access as well so that one site can't start sending network traffic across to the other site. cPanel is the best example of a system that does not provide site isolation, and it's a good way to get yourself hacked. Um, cPanel is awful for security when it comes to WordPress. Never post multiple WordPress sites on a single cPanel account. Um, naive resellers can open up their clients to privacy issues and other hacking. If you have 
uh, a cPanel account, you put multiple WordPress sites on it for, for your clients, you got a client A on there and client B, if you give client A admin access to their site and you let them install plugins in it, they can access every other site that's on that cPanel account. Do whatever they want. It is trivial. I can do it in seconds. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. So multiple sites on cPanel, don't do it. Don't use cPanel at all if you want actual site security. Really good site isolation will also allow, you know, the separate monitoring of usage and spikes and other things that could indicate a security or other type of issue. So if your platform isolates things well and also does monitoring of the sites separately, then uh, it could be a useful tool and very helpful for you or your uh, support people to figure out like what went wrong or uh, in the case where something does go wrong. Uh, I can the measures, <laughs> uh, uh, Tracking and monitoring will measure stuff like CPU bandwidth, disk usage, other things like that. All right, backup and restore. So when it comes to security, backups are both a fallback if your site gets hacked, allowing you to restore to a good copy, and a diagnostic piece for those trying to see if, if you're trying to find out how your site was hacked, uh, you can compare it to the site before it was hacked and go, oh, they changed this file here, they did this, they did that, and it can help you both clean it up if you need to. Um, let's say you've had orders and you can't directly restore the copy. You could figure out what's changed. You can do a more manual cleanup or, or you can figure out like what, what are they getting to or what are they trying to do? Backup should also be secured. And so what does that mean? Uh, they shouldn't be accessible by PHP at all. Um, you don't want the hacker to get in and also delete your backpack. Backpacks, well, your backpack either, but your backups. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so you don't want them even to be deleted by the site owner. Let's say the site owner um, screws up or their account hosting account, as we talked about, a higher level account gets compromised. Uh, you don't want the hacker to be able to go in and delete the backups there either. So uh, if you have back automatic backups and they're rotated, then um, the account owner or the uh, owner of the site, unless they shut down their entire account, um, shouldn't be able to go delete those either. Those are those are there, you know, for emergency cases. So you need your and want your backups to be secure. This is an important WordPress kind of security basic. And you also want to be able to restore your backup without running PHP or WordPress. Um, if your site's completely down or it's hacked, you won't be able to go into the WP admin and restore it. And so for all these reasons, backup plugins are not really recommended, at least by me, because at least as a primary um, backup solution, because they can rarely accomplish all these. You know, hosting level, which is often the best because it can be the most performant and it will match your hosting best, or less ideal. At least some type of third party service, you know, is often um, the best for backup solutions. All right, updates. People love to talk about updates when it comes to security. I'm gonna talk about them a little bit differently. It's not black and white. Updates, again, here comes that word risk. Updating is all about risk. Security updates are far more uh, important. Like when you update a site though, if you just apply updates anytime they're available, it depends heavily on a few factors. One is where you're hosting and all the other security pieces that we've I've talked about and will talk about. Um, but that, Based on those factors, uh, updating your site, if it's not a critical security update, it could have a greater chance of breaking your site than not updating it. And if it's not addressing a security issue, then you might be asking for more problems and all that. So um, in a nutshell, never trust anyone that says always update or the opposite. Um, really call them out, do better. People need to think about updates in terms of risk, I think. And this is, this is a really, this is a big thing for me um, because honestly on site district, uh, there are plenty of sites that don't update at all. Um, and their site, and most of the issues we have on sites are not security issues with not updating. They are sites that break because plugins updated something else and there was another plugin compatibility. So we have at least 10 times as many issues with sites from updates than from security issues. 
Um, so again, it's going to depend on your hosting platform and other things like that. But it's it's not black and white. It's all about risk, and it, you know it depends on many factors. All right, now a whole section on WordPress firewalls, how they work, what they do, why they're important. So a WordPress or HTTP firewall, um, what it does is it, we're talking about traffic. HTTP, for those who don't know, um, I just kind of threw it out there because I don't even think twice about what, what it is. Hypertext transfer protocol, I believe, um, is what the, is the protocol. It's the way that browsers talk to websites to get the website back. So they send out a request to a server and say, hey, give me back you know, give me back the website page. And HTTP is the way they do that. So a firewall also uh, speaks HTTP and it decides in a split second whether this request coming in, if it should block it or it should allow it. So it needs to, this is only, this is a yes or no decision. There's no in between. There's no, uh, maybe firewall has to decide, yes, it's good or no, I don't think so. This, uh, again, only protects the site against web traffic, doesn't cover those things that I just talked about um, before, which is, uh, you know, if someone gets in a different way through an account, um, or if someone compromises another site, and then that site has access to the files of a site they shouldn't. So this really only uh, is for traffic that come, uh, comes in through the web server. Yet, as we talked about earlier, it is the most common and for WordPress, generally the most problematic type of attack is. Um, so that's what makes firewalls quite important. Talking more about that blocking decision, which is I think this is going to answer David's question from earlier. How, do, how does a firewall decide whether to block a request? Well, there's a few things that it doesn't have actually. In some ways, it has a lot of data or it could have a lot of data. And in other ways, it's, there's not a lot there. We, we know the origin typically to some degree of where it came from. If a, if a request goes through a VPN or uh, some other kind of network that obscures the original location, then you know less about it. But even going through a VPN tells us something about that. So it's still applicable. So origin is where the request came from. We know about the request itself. We'll call that the request data. And so this includes everything that makes up the request itself. It's like, so is it a get request, which usually is you ask for a page or a post, which is a type of request when you want to modify something like add a comment or change, add a, modify a page or anything like that, um, fill out a form. Um, we will know what path on the website it's asking for, query arguments, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, some important things are like which browser is asking for it, supposedly, um, and other things. So all this request data, and that typically comes in the form of HTTP request headers, which is just a bunch of extra text that's tacked on to, to that request that you won't necessarily see in the browser unless you know to, where to look. You'll see the URL, you'll know the domain, but there's a bunch of other stuff that gets sent along with it. Um, and then reputation. And th that's basically historical data and statistics derived from the top two. So a firewall decision can be made based on, you know, we've seen a lot of bad traffic from this network or this IP address or a lot of bad traffic to this URL or something that matches something based on the origin or the request data. and then more likely this next request is not good either. And we can decide to block it based on reputation. How's that, David? Does that answer it? And did I miss it? Yeah. 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 I mean, how do you know? I mean, the origin, is it basically, like you said, we've seen a lot of bad traffic. We know, you know, do you have a lookup table of IP addresses? Does the so, file have that? <clears throat> Yeah, to get just a little bit more technical, what's the first thing and the main thing you're if that's available to you is the IP address. And as I said, that might not be the very original IP address, but it's the kind of last IP address that pushed that traffic along to the website. Um, and that can be mapped back to what's called an autonomous system, which is um it's a it's an internet thing. Basically, everyone that proxies or handles traffic on the internet 
uh, gets and that has some block of IP addresses is is an has an autonomous system and there's numbers that go with that and then names for that. So any IP address will map back, map back, map back to an autonomous system. Google is an example, Comcast, um, um, Verizon, uh, Microsoft, Cloudflare, tons and tons. There are thousands of different ASNs. And that can tell you a lot about the traffic itself. So that factors often into reputation because IP address, trying to do block and decide on traffic, traffic decisions only by IP address is, is a losing battle before you've even started. But um, if you take it up a level to the autonomous systems, which is includes big, large chunks of IP addresses, then then you can use that to make decisions. Okay. Any yeah. other questions on this one? Yeah. yeah. So what, so router firewalls, how do they fit into your scheme? Sorry, which what type of firewalls was the question? Firewalls in your router. Firewalls in the router. Um, so. Firewalls in the router will typically be um, they'll be more of a level four, level three level um, type of firewall, which may, in terms of the network stack means that they work at more of an IP level. Um, and for certain types of network traffic, have firewalls that are like network level or at lower down the stack. HTTP being layer seven of the network stack. Um, but lower level firewalls that you know well, you would find actually in a in a physical router, which is a layer three device, um, can address certain types of attacks. And a lot of the big infrastructure providers kind of handle that. And we host our sites on Amazon. And I think like Amazon, a lot of them already take care of that stuff automatically. So I don't even think about it. Um, however, um, so that pretty much never comes up that I see as an issue with sites. It's always traffic at the HTTP level. And to have a firewall that works on that, you need to have a layer seven firewall that's actually analyzing the, the traffic at the HTTP level, which is the stuff that I highlighted on this slide. Yeah, but if you're hosting your site on a server in your own in your own house or business, then I would think that the router firewall would be an important piece because you're acting as that hosting provider. Um, I would say for the most part, no, for the most part, as I highlighted on the previous slide, especially with a WordPress site, the biggest problem is just HTTP traffic and all kinds of, and H, the, the thing with HTTP traffic is you got a lot more information so you can make smarter decisions about what to block. So it's actually better just to have a really good web application firewall that handles traffic at that level and can make smarter decisions than it would be to have anything else. So, I mean, obviously, if you're hosting something at your house, which, um, I mean, I'd, I'd question why why that's being done for, for certain reasons first, but then you don't, don't want anyone breaking into your network and getting to your site in a different way. But that's, again, kind of now we're talking about getting into the site us in a different way on the side and all that too. And if you're worried about that or if that's a practical consideration, then I would say like, why why host it at home? <laughs> you know, especially if it's important. I mean, people can do that, but I'd say that's also a little bit beyond the, the scope of, of this. So yes, of course you need to have your network secured if you're at home, but from a WordPress site standpoint, um, I, the the most important thing would still be the HTTP firewall, I think. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Moving on. So let's talk about what are false positives and negatives. This is an important point with security that I think is not discussed enough. Definitely not. Um, and what's the false positive? And that's when a request, and we're talking about in the same context of a, like uh, an HTTP firewall still, when a request is blocked that should not have been blocked. So, and that could be typically causes an issue for a person, actual human, or possibly a third party tool or service that's supposed to interact with the site. Um, and false positives should ideally be re reduced to zero if possible. 
Um, and as a site owner or developer or whatever you want to call yourself, um, you should probably think about finding out if you can track false positives, identify them. If you have some kind of security going on there, figure out from your provider or your plugin or whatever you're using, like, um, can I, what happens if there's a false positive? Can I see false positives? Stuff like that. Because this is, this is one of those cases where you might have a visitor come to your site and if they don't know you personally, they get blocked. That's, they won't continue on. They'll stop. So unless, unless there's an automated system to handle that and address the false positive, which I'll talk about a little bit later, then, uh, Someone's just gotten blocked and you'll never even know about it. And so that's why I wanted to highlight false positives here is that one thing with security is people talk all about, about the bad things that could happen from actual bad guys getting in, but um, much less frequently are the cases where good people, you know, the good guys or whatever are being blocked when they shouldn't be. So that's a false positive. False negative, the opposite. Uh, it's when a request is not blocked, but should have been. Uh, the effects can be pretty much the range of issues I already covered in the previous slides, um, or it could be nothing at all. It depends on what the request is and you know what it was targeting, how severe it is. But a lot of, and false negatives are super common everywhere. And it's also subjective depending on the site, like which request really should be blocked. Um, some some requests are obviously meant to try to hack a site, but others could just inadvertently cause a denial of service in a way they crawl something too fast and maybe it's a bad bot could bring down a site too. So, um, and those aren't noticed necessarily until they're a, a bigger problem. And that's something else too I would highlight is uh, a lot of people might have, it depends how well you monitor your site, but if you've ever had your site go down, or you've ever had your site be slow, how often have you known what's caused that? Um, because quite possibly, it could be because someone is attacking your site. WordPress sites tend to not be the most efficient, we'll say, um, and can consume a decent amount of resources. And if too much traffic hits them at once or in succession, they'll slow down. And uh, so sometimes it might not be what's running on the server necessarily or the plugins you have installed or, or whatever. It could be your site's under attack if you're having an issue. So these false negatives should also be reduced. Although, as I said, often they're noticed much less than a false positive. And again, you know, if you're a site owner or developer or whatever, uh, find out if you have logs um, and other tools with enough details to, to uh, identify this, be able to look back and see like, Hey, there's a whole lot of traffic coming in here at once that shouldn't be there, or this, we don't need this, this should be blocked. So, um, and if you don't have visibility into that, well, you're, you're kind of flying blind. You have to decide whether you want to continue that way or, or find something that's going to give you more insight. All right, let's talk a little bit about the types um, of WordPress file firewalls, or rather, where do they sit? Uh, in terms of traffic. Um, one is cloud proxy. And this is a, basically it's a separate server and it sits in front of your site. It's not necessarily even on your hosting. And they'll provide you with a different IP address um, than where your site is actually hosted. And that, But inside the cloud proxy, you'll have to tell them where your site is hosted with the original IP address. And so setting up a cloud proxy will make sure all traffic goes through this cloud proxy. And then the cloud proxy makes that decision about whether to block the traffic or not. Another type of firewall is of course a WordPress plugin and that's additional PHP code that runs within the site. So when the site, a request comes in and it's handed off to PHP to be processed, um, first it hits the server, then the server has to decide what to do with it. If it passes it to PHP, then the WordPress plugin um, can run and decide whether it lets it get to the rest of WordPress. You can have a firewall at the hosting level, platform level, which means that it sits above WordPress, sits above PHP, but it's integrated with your host. It means you don't have to set up anything separate like a cloud proxy server or service or anything like that. And it's included, it's automatic. You don't have to update it, of course, either. 
Um, then kind of a less common thing, but you'll see some places is uh, where you actually put in rules into the web server configuration. Maybe you have Apache or Nginx and you have actual rules you add in there. And it could be pasted in by you or a hoster by a hosting control panel system that uh, manages your server. Um, so these are the four, four different types of WordPress firewalls. Um, any questions or did I miss anything? And I'll give examples too and names in just a moment. Which one is the most performant? Good question. Um, I will cover that a little bit, but um, it's typically not <laughs> not going to be the WordPress plugin is the, <laughs> yeah, the wrong yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah. um, and so typically stuff implemented at either cloud proxy or at the platform level um, is the most performant. You can have stuff that's pasted into the web server configuration that can be performed, performant from a CPU perspective, but not necessarily the smartest, which I'll cover in a minute. So Cloud Proxy, WAFs. WAFs stands for Web Application Firewall, used for websites. So examples of a few. Cloudflare, that's free. It's for basic protection. It's most common. It actually has many limitations. Um, we have a lot of sites that run Cloudflare, but we block a lot of traffic that comes straight through Cloudflare that's not good. So uh, Cloudflare is is generic, um, mostly generic. They have some more specific things. And this is where you get into like, okay, if you want Cloudflare to really protect WordPress well, then you might have to do a lot of customization for it. So that's a limitation too. Uh, Sucuri, which is now owned by GoDaddy, uh, hmm. their product is actually called um, Cloud Prox Cloud, is it Cloud Proxy? Anyway, it's paid. Um, honestly, most people I see end up using it only after they're hacked and then upsold by GoDaddy. So they'll be hosted on GoDaddy. And then GoDaddy will say, oh, well, you need security. Pay this much extra a year. We'll clean up your site. And then you pay this much extra a year for the rest of whenever. And then Encapsula, uh, most people probably won't know this word, but a few might know SiteLock. Uh, SiteLock resells them. They're not too open about it, though. If you Google... Uh, on that, you'll find some really interesting pages on the web. Um, but, but it also has false positives. It's overpriced. And again, uh, mostly only used by people that were hacked because they were hosted on GoDaddy, Bluehost, or another EIG new full digital host. And they're scammed into buying this. And they're not too open about their partnership or connections with, the, with these two companies. So. Uh, so that's it for cloud proxies that sit in front of a site. Uh, WordPress security plugins, firewall plugins. Too many to list, none to recommend. Sorry, I'm not actually gonna even name names on this one. Um, I named names on the previous one just so people are kind of are aware and, and that one's common to know, but anyone can find a list of WordPress firewall security plugins. Um, however, they're guaranteed pretty much to crumple any, under any high volume attack. Um, PHP just cannot handle thousands of, you know, hundreds of requests per second. So if you've got something, even with an efficient firewall plugin, it's almost always guaranteed to, to crumple under a high volume attack. So that's a disadvantage with that. Uh, false positives with a lot of these security plugins are just too common. Um, I, I will name a name actually, because um, it's a popular one, WordFence. Um, WordFence is, we barely have any sites left running WordFence. And the few sites that I've left it on, it's mostly for a curiosity. And every time I look into the WordFence logs to look for, um, well, here, here's a here's an important point. Our own firewall at Site District sits on top of WordFence. So any requests come in, hit our firewall first, and then anything we don't block then goes to WordFence. Um, anytime I look in WordFence logs to see what it's been blocked is almost always a false positive. So uh, we don't recommend any plugins because some of these plugins will, they're actually blocking valid users. Um, and I'll talk about one of the, the uh, bad practices for, for blocking traffic. Um, that's one, one of the things that causes these false positives. Um, and plugins can't fix insecure hosting. Like we talked about earlier, they can't fix cPanel. Um, 
They can't containerize a site that's not containerized. Um, however, plugins are most commonly used, partly because they're free, and I didn't add it on here, partly because people don't know any better. All right, now on to hosting providers and uh, actual WordPress or web application firewalls that are built into the hosting platform. Well, they're less known and they're not well advertised. And there's a, a pretty reasonable explanation for this. Um, one of the most common ones is that they, they don't have to. Uh, when hosting providers put wet, uh, firewalls on their hosting, part of it's to benefit them. Um, it's to keep the bad traffic down and out. It's of course to benefit their customers too, but they don't need to advertise as much because take for example, in contrast, a WordPress plugin, that's a firewall plugin, especially one you might pay for. They might advertise that they blocked a bunch of attacks or all their features or make it very configurable or something like that because why you're pay they need to prove their value to you, These the plugins do. Uh, the firewalls that are built into the hosting um, they, they're they there, as I said, they, they prevent attacks and all that, but there's less need to, to prove their value unless they're an add-on service, which I guess is maybe the exception here. But if it's built in and it comes with any plan on there, then the hosting provider doesn't need to prove the value as much because you're also there for the hosting. You, you can't just say like, oh, I don't want your firewall anyway, and, but you know, okay, but you still have the hosting, so. Um, like cloud proxies and other stuff, uh, the hosting providers' uh, firewalls are going to be automatically updated as often as they do. That takes effect across all sites. You don't have to worry about updating plugins. Uh, examples of hosting providers with web application firewalls. Again, this list is it's very short, and I don't know a lot too because not a lot advertise it. But some of the if we without going into defining what managed WordPress hosting means, but a lot of the managed word with quotes wordpress hosts will often have some kind of firewall and it varies how effective they are too so but i've seen especially brute force attacks and stuff often blocked on wp engine and, and kinsta for example so there are wordpress hosts out there that have firewalls um but i've also seen many hosts giving up and partnering with cloudflare i think to stop bigger attacks the ones the host cares about so rather than they're not blocking or worrying about the vulnerability that might infect your site, which actually is you should be more worried about, but they're worried about DDoS attacks and other high traffic attacks that are more complex and harder to block. And I've the trend has been that um, both the, the ones I mentioned above, WP Engine and Kinsta are both now partnering and using Cloudflare. And I think it's because security and doing blocking all these kind of attacks is, is hard um and they kind of just wanted it and cloudflare is an amazing company technology and you know ip wise so uh they're punting it off to them um we haven't done that partly because i've been working on this for years and um i've already built a mini cloudflare <laughs> That's basically what site we have built into site district. So this security was a concern from the beginning nine years ago. So we've done a lot of the work already. And in a lot of cases, we block traffic better than Cloudflare. So I'm both pretty happy and pretty proud with what we have. And we don't have don't feel like we need to partner with Cloudflare. Um, and again, Cloudflare, I think, is uh, these hosts are using it to block bigger attacks that will affect all their sites at once rather than your individual site. They care less about your individual site um, being hacked or going down, they're they're they don't want the performance types of problems that from bigger distributed attacks. All right, web server firewall rule, the the last type of firewall that I've mentioned. It's kind of very dumb compared to more advanced firewalls because it's just a list of rules. Um, and they typically lack lack any way to handle false positives. If a human visits a site and triggers the firewall, you're you're stuck. There's nothing to nothing to get past it. Um, they can't examine requests as closely as a firewall that's built on more dynamic code like you'd find elsewhere in the other three types. Um, and they kind of lack that ability to make decisions based on reputation in most cases. Um, they're not effective uh, against many types of DDoS or more complex attacks either. So, And they can have a high rate of false positives. 
need to be updated frequently. Um, I guess why, you know, if, if you're looking at these bullet points, you're asking why do people bother? I think one answer is, you know, they perform pretty decently. And if you don't have a cloud proxy and your hosting doesn't have a its own firewall, then maybe this is a, 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 a better performing option than a plugin. Some examples are not gigabyte. I don't know why I got the second B on there. Seven, 6G, 7G firewall from, I forgot what the guy's name is, but um, I, people talk about this like it's a good thing. Um, is it? But uh, I think it's inferior to a lot of other solutions. All right, moving on, malware scanning. Um, I only put a few bullet points on this. This has been a topic that's come up recently, although I didn't really read into what people are saying on it, but my opinion on this, if you need to do malware scanning, it's you already screwed up. Um, so this is kind of based on experience. Um, I'll admit that site district, we don't do malware scanning. And the reason is because we haven't needed to. Um, the only time we have sites with malware on them is um, is because a site was migrated from somewhere else and it was hacked there. And that's not something you, you need to do a cleanup in that case. You don't need a periodic thing going and inefficiently scanning all your files for malware. I won't get into the technical details, but there are definitely better ways to, um, to detect, um, prevent malware infections. There, there's even software for this rather than sitting there and scanning it. Scanning it is kind of has a bad connotation like you're you're trolling, you're, you're slowly going over all the files. And that can have that can burn up a lot of resources and cause performance problems in its own right and can cause more problems than it solves, especially if your sites never get hacked. Security and settings. So um I know David mentioned something about asking a question about like, well, what about what settings would I configure in a plugin or security? So what's important? And I'm gonna take the argument that like, for most firewalls, having a lot of settings is generally a bad thing. Um, ideally, the author would have set things in a way, you know, so that, Things are taken care of. In fact, on Site District, there are pretty much no settings that you can, there's nothing you can do to, to adjust our firewall. Our firewall works the same across all sites. Um, and it's being constantly updated and adjusted and tweaked, but that's based on feedback. Um, and when we deploy a change or a fix, it's something that we think through very carefully and make sure it uh, should and does apply to all sites. So why then do you have all these plugins with all these settings that you might adjust. Well, I would argue in some case, the developer didn't actually know it was best and you just put a bunch of things in there. Could be the developer didn't understand WordPress traffic well enough, so which is kind of a similar thing. And then worst of all is to appease customers that think they know about security better than the plugin author, which sometimes they might, but... Um, and so someone's trying to sell something I'm like, I need to be able to block this or I need the ability to block these IPs or do this or something like that. Um, you can you get enough customers piling up and you've got this gigantic confusing settings page inside the firewall that um, is, like I said, I think becomes more of a bad thing than a than a good thing. So it's so maybe not the answer everyone wanted to hear, but it's that's my thoughts. Let's highlight some bad practices when it comes to WordPress and security. All right, I didn't talk about what XML RPC is, but it, there's a script and there's a file inside WordPress that lets uh, certain systems talk to it. Um, and Automatic, who runs uh, WordPress.com, of course, and uh, uses Jetpack, actually uses this script quite a bit. Um, but some play, some people will tell you prevent brute force attacks by disabling XML RPC. Well, it's true that a lot of attacks hit this file, but disabling it means you break it for all the le possible legitimate users. So it's a bad practice. Um, um, our firewall, for example, uses reputation and a bunch of other signals to figure out whether requests are blocked or not. So it's a better way of 
changing the admin and login URL. This again goes back to this is bad user experience. It changes things from what people are expecting, what they're used to, and it actually doesn't really help most with security. One reason being, you change your login URL, all these bots are going to hit the URL anyway, and even though they might not hit the login URL, which they have a low chance as long as your password is decent of brute forcing your, your, self, your um, site anyway, they're just going to generate a bunch of 404s from WordPress that will or could overwhelm your site or just use up resources anyway. So don't change the admin login URL. Have a firewall that knows how to protect the login and the admin properly. Limiting login attempts, another generally bad practice. If you have a good firewall that knows how to block brute force attacks, then you don't need to limit login attempts because really the only people that are going to be log trying too many passwords are ones that really for are actually legitimate users that are sat there forget and forgot their password. And so if you put a plugin like this on your site and it's well protected by a good firewall, you're just going to hurt good people. CAPTCHA, we've already talked about that. Just kind of a pain in the, but if you can avoid it, avoid it. Uh, disabling content comments. There are valid reasons to do this, but I wouldn't, if you find yourself disabling comments because you're getting spam comments, again, the argument is you're doing it wrong. You should have something else that just protects um, that endpoint. Um, IP whitelisting. Um, if you find yourself having a, whitelist IP addresses, then something there's probably something else is doing something wrong. Um, I won't say there's never a case for this, but both blacklisting and whitelisting IP addresses is almost always a losing battle. <laughs> um, and I, I won't go into more details about that, but if you find yourself doing that, then you might want to ask someone about a better solution. Um, too many options, like I covered in the last slide. If there are too many security options. That's a bad practice. So most most things should not be extra configurable. Uh, let the experts who build the software take care of configuring things. Um, and blocking by countries. So um, this is still a thing. Apparently, um, people want to block by countries, and in some cases, they might have a legitimate reason, but most traffic, in fact, the majority of bad traffic that we see across sites comes from within the US. There's plenty of bad traffic from elsewhere too, but you've got cloud providers and other stuff that maps physically back to the United States. And that is a majority of bad traffic. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're doing country blocking, then again, you're doing it wrong. As I mentioned earlier, if you can rely on something like autonomous systems and, and different types of network that's much more reliable because a certain type of network is going to be a hosting provider. A certain type of network might be a an ISP that has human traffic and, and it's much better way to determine whether traffic is good or not. All right. I have a question. Yes. Um, for a GDPR, um, if you block like European countries that require GDPR because you don't have the infrastructure to offer that is that and you like put in your tos that you know you don't serve europe is that a legitimate protection from the gdpr enforcement? so that's um i'm not a lawyer and whatever the disclaimer is i can't give legal advice yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um that's is also that a rule of reason to do blocking countries at all even well th so that that's a, a legal like type of question, right? Rather than a security right. question, yeah. I think. So, um, and I would say maybe, um, I'm not an expert on GDPR. Fair enough. Um, that's, that's I think that, I think that's a, in my personal opinion, it's kind of a sad when people have to resort to that. Uh, it's unfortunate, um, but, that's that's really just a personal kind of opinion more than anything. So, Fair but uh, you know, maybe it is a maybe it's effective. Maybe it covers your, uh, you know, covers you legally. But that's not something I can actually speak to. All right, next slide. So, how do you know if your WordPress host cares about security? I want to open this up before I show everyone my answer. So, I want at least like a few people to tell me what they think. 
give an answer on this one. And if someone wants to put it in chat and someone else can read it, that's fine too. Anyone still listening? <laughs> yeah, we're here. I'm here. <laughs> Uh, anyone ha just have an answer? Throw something out. Theory, a guess, opinion, whatever. I have a bare minimum. I had a client that um, they had they had bought their own hosting, and it did not offer two-factor authentication. I mean, okay. You put it there if you want it. That would be my okay. answer to why oh. they don't care about security. <laughs> okay. So there's a one answer. Um, they care about it if they enter... Uh, offer two-factor authentication so um it still wouldn't necessarily mean they're good but at least that's like bare in, minimum <laughs> in case anyone doesn't know what that means let me explain quickly um two-factor authentication is just basically means you need some extra way besides your password to log into the site um which could be if they text you a code or they email you a code or you've got an app on your phone that you get a code from that you add. So it's if, and what it's effective for is if someone steals your password, really two-factor authentication Authentication is basically is if your password gets stolen. It's, it, it's, it's rather limited in terms of its security application, but it covers that pretty well. So that's two-factor authentication. Other answers? I would say if, if the uh, um, so some hosts actually recommend you do not put any security plugins on on your site. Okay, so, so if I would the say host... that they they're they're taking responsibility for it. Okay, and, and saying it's best done at the server level. Okay, and um, so so I would say that those are those are com those are companies that that care. They're willing to to. Okay, that mean that they're taking a risk in telling you to not do it. Right, either, I like that. Either that, or they don't want to deal with the side effects of when they break, and so telling you to not use them is the easiest solution for them. Okay. We got two answers. How about a third one before I reveal what I picked? Someone. <laughs> one more. One more. One more. I say if you call and, and they answer and, and talk to you about their security, then obviously they care about it instead of dodging you. Okay, so our third answer, if they'll talk to you about security, take the time. So, all right, let me reveal my answer. And my answer is if they'll clean up your site for free, if it ever gets hacked, plain and simple. And let me explain that just a little bit. And this kind of goes along with what David said. He said, you know, if they, um, if they say don't run security plugins, it's very kind of, I forgot the word I want to use, but it, it matches up with that. You know, if they're going to tell you that they're taking a risk, right? And they're expecting that what they have is good enough that they won't have to deal with it um, because nothing will happen. So this is kind of the, the same thing, but I would say taken to a, another level, a level up from that. Because the host can tell you don't run security plugins, but what if your site does get hacked? Then, you know, what's then? Oh, well, I'm sorry, your site got hacked. Uh, now, if you just pay us $100, we'll we'll clean it up or whatever. Well, so that doesn't help. So I, I think my answer is a, a host really cares about security if they'll clean up your site for free if it gets hacked. And that's because that's time consuming. Um, no host wants to do that. <laughs> Honestly, so if they if they will offer that, then my argument is then they care about security. So, all right, I'll move on. I don't think I have too many more. I know this is coming up. Uh, we've taken a while here, so um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about site district because obviously you know that's where a lot of my security experience is based and kind of what it's gone into. So, just talk a little bit. So on site district, we try to make sure we cover the basics with we've containerized sites. We do we have the backups like we talked about. We have a firewall. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, most sites don't run any security spam or firewall plugins. In fact, uh, one common thing I'll get from people is, 
Um, they moved their site over to site district and the spam just stopped. It just went away. Like they would get, oh, I get one spam comment or form submission a week. And like, it's just gone now. Um, this is based on nine years of anal analysis of real traffic. Um, I'm definitely a data nerd and I've spent more time than I even want to care to admit or imagine um, looking at data and charts and requests and all this stuff over the last nine years. Uh, for like a thousand, every thousand sites on site just were blocking like at least one attack every five minutes. And that's not, when I say attack, I don't mean a request. Um, I'm defining that as basically 150 requests being blocked within about two or three minutes. So that uh, that's like the threshold for attack. We get much larger attacks too, but you know we'll have bursts of traffic from bots coming in, hitting mm -hmm. all types of different URLs. They're often all the same. They're very kind of stupid. You're like, oh, it's another one of those again, if you're looking at the logs. Um, but that happens quite frequently. Uh, many longer or large scale attacks never actually happen on site district. And that's because bots, once they're blocked the first time, they might not get any URLs to crawl or to continue to, or they'll give up. So just stopping them earlier can stop bigger attacks. Um, our firewall and security is distributed. It's running on servers across the world. Any site on site district gets an IP address that actually will route traffic to the nearest of, I think, 20 uh, or so servers all around the world uh, running on Amazon's infrastructure. And on each of those, we have our own code running and that will check the request and decide whether to forward it onto the origin server where the site actually lives. Um, we offer that free site cleanup on my uh, on migration. So if your site's hacked elsewhere and you move it over, we'll clean it up. And then um, if your site gets hacked while hosted with us, we'll clean up for free too. That was it. Um, so I threw in a couple of fun charts uh, from our analytics that I just took screenshots of today. So uh, this one's a fun one, the WP login URL. This is where you log into WordPress, whether you come to the admin or, or whatever, um, you hit WP login.php. And unless you messed with your URL, don't do that. Um, so you, as you can imagine, anyone could hit that URL. So it's, and coming straight to it. So we actually block close to 90% of requests just to view that page. Um, and that's not something. That can be done easily because it's come to yet. We're able to block nine or 10 requests that hit that because we can figure out that request and from the reputation and other things like that, it's a good request or not. So, um, so we're blocking pretty consistently 90% of requests to this URL. That's our, you could say our brute force protection plus the actual request that try passwords, which would be the post request, which is kind of that orange color. Um, sign up. If you've got registration open on your site, people will hit this URL and our firewall blocks 85% of those on average. Uh, comments. I don't know why people ever hit a do get requests to this, but they somehow seem to come from somewhere. But most requests are a post request to add a comment to a blog. And you can't see the exact number on that, but it's over 99% of requests to this to the WordPress comments URL are blocked by our firewall and site district. Uh, XML RPC requests. Also very close to 100% of those are blocked, but not all of them. Like I said, there's legitimate traffic to that URL. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna block all of it. Um, also all requests to XML RPC should be a post request. So any get request is basically junk. Um, contact pages. If you've got a contact page on your site, then we're a lot of, there's a lot of junk that hits those and we block maybe 10% of requests just to access that page and then variable 10 to 20% of requests to post, you know, submit to those contact pages. Um, a lot of bots go looking for random weird PHP files across the site, which if they're not blocked and generate 404 errors, or if you happen to have a vulnerable site, they might find a back door in where they shouldn't. 
And so our firewall is also blocking like 80 something percent of unrecognized P requests that end in like .php, something .php that don't include common WordPress files. Uh, SQL injection, this is not a percentage one. This is just like there's SQL injection uh, attacks and I'm not going to define that, but hopefully some people already know what that is. It's just another type of attack that people can use to get into a site. And then we're blocking those. And then just overall, it varies a little bit, but I think we're blocking around a million requests, uh, up to a million plus or minus um, every day for the sites that we host. Um, kind of coming back to the idea of like, well, what about the login URL? How do you know you're not blocking the wrong valid people or legitimate people? How, how do you know you're not causing false positives? So what we do is on site, we, we, uh, there's a, you get three attempts kind of in a way there's a first request comes through. We look at what we know about it already and we decide whether to block it or not. Uh, if it gets blocked, then a JavaScript challenge gets issued. If you're a human using a real browser, then the browser automatically do some run some code and report back to us stuff that we can use to determine whether it appears you are a bot or not. And then if we still don't like what we see well enough, then there's a more human challenge. And that it takes the form of a very simple box that's like, I'm not a robot. And you've probably seen this otherwise. No pictures, nothing. In fact, that's not even a real checkbox. Uh, and there's no form on the page. Um, which is intentional so that bots wouldn't be able to click it as easily. And it's not just clicking that that tells us whether it's a human either, but other um, interaction type of data. So we look to see like, does this seem like it's actually a human clicking it? So, um, so any firewall that blocks requests that might come from humans, you wanna make sure you have some type of um, way to handle false positives. So this is kind of how ours, ours works. Conclusion, summary, I'm pretty much done. Um, and these are just some kind of random thoughts I had as I threw this slide together. I don't know how well they summarize the whole talk, but WordPress security is mostly about preventing, you know, bad things from happening to your sites, your clients, your customers. Um, the way in which WordPress is vulnerable to these bad things uh -huh. is generally pretty well known and they're specific and very effective ways, luckily, to compensate or to, to pr pr protect your site. Um, and think about, unless you can review your site and track of traffic effectively with your tools and logs, you might not have any idea what's actually going on with your site in terms of security and all that too. So ask yourself, you know, is that important? Do you want to know more? Or are you with someone that's taking care of it already? And that is hopefully looking at those logs and tools, if, even if you're not. Um, and then once again, blocking or encumbering users, uh, making, causing bad UX issues is a very big problem. And I think it should get more attention um, within security. Uh, talks and just the security space in general. So um, that's that. Um, so questions, and I'm going to stop sharing because I can't see anyone's faces except for four of you. <laughs> so uh, anyone else has that questions, go ahead and shoot shoot them off. And comments too. If you thought my talk this was the first time I gave the talk, so. I, my feelings won't be hurt if you rip into it a bit. <laughs> Was it too long, too yeah. short? Good cover. Did I miss anything big? You know, any of that kind of stuff. I thought that was a good presentation for someone like myself, who's very uh, naive about the whole uh, situation. Um, I'm going to, uh, reserve a question until I um, get some advice that it's okay to ask, but I'm currently, you know, up against uh, a, a malware uh, incursion on a, on a, on, on a friend's site that uh, he's asked me to take a look at. And um, uh, so you let me know if you want to know more specifics. Uh, yeah. I love cleaning up to a degree hacked sites and, you know, um, I mean, if I were to look at it, hopefully what I presented today will kind of give you some context around all of it. Um, uh, 
Yes. Uh, in terms of hack sites, one thing I don't think I put in the slides is it's really important to think about why it got hacked. And often, and I'm obviously biased because I run a hosting company and, um, but in most cases, the first thing to do when you get hacked is get off your hosting because if your hosting cared about, you know, unless they're cleaning out for free and they have a very good explanation for why the site got hacked, can trace it down to exactly what requests when and what happened, unless they can tell you all those details like that, usually you probably want to get off somewhere else because they, you know, weren't doing their job. So, um it's not usually a good idea to clean up a hex site on your current hosting if they're not covering the, the other bases for you. That kind of makes sense. In in my case, again, if I if I may, because no one else is jumping yeah, in. Go ahead. Uh, the in this case, uh, I'll be specific. Uh, site was on uh, GoDaddy, and uh, I think that you named at least three very obvious. Uh, vulnerabilities that the site had had for some time. Um, so it had that um, open uh, uh, available. It was, uh, they were random development sites that were still attached to the cPanel. Uh, there were comments not being um, moderated. There were uh, users being, uh, a lot of users <laughs> like, I think the site had some 300 some users on it. Um, so uh, what I had suggested in my naive, uh, <laughs> you know, a recommendation was let's move this whole thing over to another hosting site, try to get it cleaned up, and then uh, reestablished. Um, so it went from a GoDaddy site uh, to a Bluehost site. Uh, once it hit Bluehost, uh, we were informed it's not functional. There's malware, mm -hmm. so Bluehost wasn't at least wasn't going to continue with it, which is fine. They put you on a temporary non-HTTPS uh, builder site anyway, builder location anyway. Um, so then they say, "Gosh, we'd be happy to fix this problem for you, Bluehost. It's going to cost you three hundred dollars a year oh. ongoing." We'll, did, did, we'll uh, clean it up for three hundred dollars. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, they didn't mention specifically site lock was mm -hmm. not, uh, but uh, specifically it would uh, DDDS, DDoS protection, XSS and SQLI protection, block automated bot attacks, and script injections were uh, some of their selling points for this. So they would clean it all up. Um, but the, the the site came over, it was migrated. Um, this is just probably dumb, but it got migrated that whole thing, the, the cPanel, all the extra crummy old, old you know, development part sites and stuff. <laughs> it's all, and then we got the whole chunk of it uh, migrated over. So now it's sitting on an unsecure <laughs> site at Bluehost and they wanna clean it up and charge ongoing for 300 bucks. So. Uh, this doesn't sound like something the client wants, the not client, but this is my friend, but if you would be, you know, this is not something my friend uh, wants uh, to spend. So he he just would prefer it not be that way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so um, uh, now I would just like to give him some, uh, because I stuck my big foot in it already, I would like to give him some uh, suggestions and advice on what to do. That we okay. were bot hosting, we've already bought migration, so it's not a good place to be, but. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe someone else wants to chime in <laughs> too, um, but I have two, I think two comments. Um, one being probably the most hacked sites. They have a lot more customers. So granted there's this too, but I've seen more hacked sites on both GoDaddy and probably GoDaddy number one and second might be HostGator or Bluehost, which are owned by the same company. So um, generally anytime there's a hack site on either of those, it's the recommendation is, is get it off, go somewhere else. Where else? Um, obviously, you know, <laughs> you could put it on site district. There's other places too. Um, 
most place yeah some place that will clean it up as part of the migration for free i think is a big thing and that should really be a minimum um so and yeah in your case i mean you're not in an ideal situation if you can get your money back from bluehost yeah. i mean that that's where i would go let me just add one more part of the question, and I'm 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 already loving your your offer at, at site district, by the way. Um, but um, the, the question is, if that you know, it's not that hard of a site to rebuild. Um, that was kind of where I was coming from. To said, we'll just get it over here. Uh, I'll have access to you know the files. You can stop posting over there, or you can you know anyway, it can still run over there while we're fixing it. But let's get it over I've, to another place. And, and I've heard this concern decently, uh, frequently enough, and it, um, but it's kind of it's usually people with not a lot of experience with hack sites fishing for a solution, which is fine. Yeah. Um, but in my my own experience, it's pretty rare that I'll see a a site that is hacked that's not recoverable. It's it's usually I can usually clean up a site in about thirty minutes. Okay, so for first um, that, then just rebuild it. Is what I said. Uh, there, I'll just to finish the question. When I yeah. suggested to Bluehost over the phone at the time, uh, oh, this is a problem. Why don't we just rebuild it? It's not that big a deal. The suggestion that came back was, "You're the, you, It's just as likely that they've targeted the the URL um, as the as the site files, uh, even though I, I I I kind of already identified what the problems were." Uh, multiple, uh, but they they suggested even if you rebuilt from scratch, that you would have a target on your URL. Uh, I'm not even sure what that means. You know <laughs> or what, what that means by that, but I, I I would take take what they say with a bit of a grain of salt. But in my experience, I mean, I would the first thing I always do is like, give me a copy, let me look at it. And I, I look and see what's what's going on. And then, like I said, in most cases, I can just clean it up really quickly. Uh, in rare cases, it's like, oh, this is a bit messier. But most, you know, if you want me to take a look, the, the first, you know, if, again, I don't want to keep this stuck on any one person, but you can contact me afterwards and I can, you know, if you can get me into your site, I can take a quick look, so. Well, you love. would <clears throat> be you like love. a hero. So where, where would I put my contact information in the chat? Um, let's see. You can, let's see. Let me just drop mine in there. <laughs> you can email me. Thank you. Go to everyone. And then now I'm going to shut up for whoever it is that's trying to talk. I apologize. No, it's actually it was interesting, Carol, what you're, what you're, what you're bringing up. So I think it kind of concludes that what he, his big thing was, I can clean up your site, which to me is how you should lead your presentation um that you that your big thing is you offer it for free right well so, that's one of many things but no, no, <laughs> when you, it comes you, to security that's what that's one yeah yeah, yeah i get it I, but you asked a question of whether the, what, I, what i thought about the presentation and i think it was way too long i think it was way <laughs> okay. too complicated i think your front end you should summarize that in a couple of slides and, okay. and, and save your time for the back end where you talk talk about how great you are and what you're going to do for me because I thought that part, the, la the latter part of the presentation was really good. I also think you might have a summary slide of your, um, of kind of the numbers, you know, where you talk about a million things being blocked and all that, maybe yeah. come up with some sort of a <clears throat> summary, summary slide of those. Because I think that was really good data, right? To see uh, what you're doing. Because I my, try to understand your audience. Is, is your audience folks like us or is your audience other type people? What's the, who's your audience? Well, obviously for this presentation, my audience is, is everyone here, <laughs> all you guys. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what kind of people are you looking at? You, you, is this for a sales presentation? Is this a, you're going to go. Oh, yeah. No, this wasn't meant to be like a sales presentation, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I've spent a lot of time building what, you know, it's a security talk and I have a really good security solution. And I think it'd actually be negligent not to, not to mention and highlight it, if nothing else, to get people to think about like there's another way to handle this there's a better way to do this you know so even if someone's not itching to move their site it's i think i hope i communicated a lot of um important 
kind of concepts and ways to think about. I think, you, I think that was my point is you kind of, you know, gave us a little bit of an insight into is because we all go to some hosting provider, right? Is the what are the things we should look for in a hosting provider? You know, that to me, that's a, that was good information. Some of the things about, you know, not using the word admin or using admin as your username or whatever is not a big deal and, and why. I know I just think if, um, I think you focused on the second half. I think you got a good presentation. I'd also, this ought to be a blog because with a blog, at least you could go a little, little deeper. Um, okay. You know, kind of explain what's going on. Because I, I imagine at the end, though, Matt, it's you do want to get people to come over to your your site, right, and uh, and host. So ultimately, it's a sales presentation. It's this is a good white paper or a good backup of why your site is is the one to come to as opposed to others. Okay. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Oh, I have a quick question. Um. What do you think about how to manage the trade-off between the ease of like a WordPress dashboard, you know, where you can access 20, 50, whatever of your clients' websites versus the security, potential security risk of that? Um, I'm thinking like managed WP, you know, those okay. types of, of things. Right. Using like a, like a management tool that can access multiple WordPress sites. So, um. <laughs> That's a good question. This is topic has actually come up recently, you know, um, in discussions with Mark, who just his face just dropped off the camera there. But um, I, I actually am myself curious more about those providers that have these control panels that are used to manage sites. Like, if what kind of security issues they have, or what uh, if they have these issues? Um, hopefully, you know, they provide these protections. Um, there's, you know, managed WP is obviously a service hosted by GoDaddy and, you know, you could theoretically, I am GoDaddy, GoDaddy is, gets beat up on a lot and has had some, you know, they're a big target, right? So more people are going to go after it and people that get in through the door, there's definitely the potential they could get to your managed WP and then into your managed WordPress sites. Um, so, but I think the risk is less than a lot of the other stuff I covered today in, in practical terms. Um, you're more likely to have your site just beat up by a bunch of requests that slow it down or uh, have a plugin that didn't get patched um, quickly enough or something like that. And it, you didn't have a firewall that was covering it, that kind of thing. Um, I think a good backup to that is managed WP or main WP or infinite WP or WP remote or whatever any of these management tools that you might use to access your sites. Um, some of them provide backups, of course, right? So having um, a second layer that secures your site, like if that tool gets compromised and it infects your sites, can your hosts or you know, restore that, you know, what if you get locked out of that tool? Do you have a second, like a backup way to get, get your sites back, I guess is a good, is an important thing to like consider. So, but I think the, the risk is generally low. It's something I'm, I'm actually curious about. I, I know these providers probably have a lot more in it. Uh, having a centralized solution, if, you know, something goes wrong with them, you know, it's going to be bad press and bad news and they're going to lose a lot of customers. So they're going to be more invested in security than, than, than just the average. <laughs> so. okay. okay, I hope that was a decent answer. Yeah, no, that makes me feel better. <laughs> That's the one thing I always worry about, even, I said, even with, you know, complicated passwords and whatnot. But yeah, and it's a valid concern. I was talking to Mark about this. I was like, I really wonder, is like, do they have issues with... I mean, the one that I think uh, I was most interested in is main WP because main WP is infinite WP also runs on your own hosting, but main WP is actually just a plugin. So you run it on a WordPress install. So um, to me, theoretically, what if you've got all your site, your child sites, as they call them on secure hosting, but your parent site running main WP isn't as secure, right? So that's to me, theoretically a big hole in a chunk in your armor, right? So you'd want to make sure, you know, your site hosting main WP is just as secure. And that being a WordPress site, host self-hosting it, that's where you do have to make a good decision in terms of 
hosting and security. I have a question. Yes. Great. Um, I was wondering about, well, I have two questions. One of them is if you're just starting out a brand new site, um, which I do kind of a bunch, um, I want to just know what the like quickest way to be able to essentially walk away from the site without really sweating or, you know, having nightmares, um, you know, what is like the sort of the like MVP of security for a site before you have time to really do everything with it. Um, and for example, there are plugins that are like under construction pages that you can put up and then nobody can access the pages of the site or maybe like the um, even the login forms or the um, co comment forms and things like that. But what would you say is like the minimum threshold to just start a brand new site and, and be able to walk away from it confidently? Um, uh, like without, without being on, I guess, secure, um, or sorry, um, without being on your, your, your hosting platform. Well, I mean, in general, like hosting and secure hosting and that, you know, I talked about the different pieces of that, right. You know, backups and firewall and site isolation you know, are important pieces. So, I mean, I would still recommend no matter where you host, you, you've got kind of the basics covered in those terms. Um, and then I don't think it necessarily matters where it's a new site or existing site so much. I mean, with a new site, there's non-security type things that you might be thinking about, which is like, are bots going to crawl my site and index it before I'm ready or something like that. But like, you know, there's, as you mentioned, it could be an under construction page or it could be the box in, um, in WordPress, you say, don't crawl my site or discourage search engines that handles that kind of stuff. But yeah, from from security, I mean, I would just start with, you know, start with some secure hosting, really, no matter where it is. Mm -hmm. um, and there are secure hosts that will let you start your website for free, too, without even paying for it. Um, we currently do that. Uh, I think you can spin up a free site on Pantheon, although mm -hmm. Pantheon I wouldn't necessarily recommend because it's its own special beast. Um, I forget what other ones out there, but, um, and then there are low cost options that are decently secure too. If you don't have a lot of traffic, a host named Closed, C-L-O-S-T-E. Um, if you just want really good performance and you don't have a lot of traffic and don't be scared off by their pricing, which is they basically charge you for usage um, in a very granular way. But I have a test site that gets no traffic and sits on there. Um, and it runs like $4 a month. Um, and, you know, there's backups there. And I think they've got a, it's a more managed solution. It's got a decent amount of security. Um, I can't speak with their, about their support uh, necessarily. But I think in my case, I, I use um, InMotion with a shared server and a, you know, well, I'm going to be calling them after this to ask about uh, isolated cPanel hosting to see what options there are for that because it seems that the normal user interface is just, you know, you're expected to use a cPanel and host multiple sites from it. Um, so I'm really appreciating that point that you're really emphasizing tonight, um, how that can be like an exposure. Okay. Yeah. InMotion is one of those hosts that I would generally consider get away from it quickly. <laughs> okay. um, and I would, if you're building a new site and this is a different topic, but that I've also, <laughs> I also like to talk about, but I'd be more concerned about your time. And if your dashboard's slow and like a lot of the entry level hosts if you're clicking around in the WordPress admin and you're loading pages, you're making edits, you're working a lot in the, the website, performance matters. Every time that page loads slower, and some people don't get used to this, you won't even notice the difference. But when you get on, you go from an entry level host to a more optimized, faster host, um, including either Site District or Kinsta or Close that I mentioned or something like that, 
your productivity can go just way up. So if you're actively building a new site, security is probably one of your lesser concerns. Like I, I'd worry more about the fact that your site is already slow and you haven't barely, barely started building it. So, you know, you want your dashboard to be snappy and fast. So that's, uh, that's my two cents on that. That's great. I definitely appreciate it. Um, I have one other question. I can wait if there's other questions. Anyone else put up a hand if someone else wants to jump in? Oh, go ahead, Andrew. So I am wondering about best practices for working with essentially development site, staging site, and then production site and, and launching from staging to production without overriding the database. I'm looking at WP Vivid as a solution and they have a database um, migration plugin that's extra cost, but I'm not sure about if there's a best practices around doing this so that you're uh, not losing database data on migration. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. And I was smiling and smirking a little bit because Mark's also smirking over there too. Um, and because we just talked about this topic the other day and um, in a nut, there's best, there's like, is there a technical solution for it, a good one? And um, from the research I've done, and I actually started working on one too, but the research I've done there, no one's really solved the like merging problem. Um, it's easy to develop a site and push it up, but if you have changes happening in two places on a WordPress site and you want to merge them cleanly together, I would say it's generally considered kind of an unsolved problem so far. Lots of people have attempted it with various degrees of success, but I don't think there's, so nothing that's just works everywhere and that's great. So I think that leads us to, okay, what do people, how do people make do with that? And so, um, and I know a little bit less than that. People use different plugins to push stuff. I might actually ask Mark to jump in and uh, say what he knows, but um, some, if it changes, the thing is with a lot of themes and page builders and other things, you've got a lot of changes happening in the database, right? So you can't just update or overwrite the database while keeping the files or something. So um, what I think a lot of people tend to do is if they build a new version of something like let's see you've got a live site and it's accepting orders or comments or whatever or getting new posts published and you're working on a new theme and you want to merge, merge the new theme i think what people commonly will do is just reapply those changes over they'll freeze um, development and then merge or put everything into the staging site kind of in a more manual way yeah, I don't unfortunately have a really good answer. Anyone else want to jump in or um, did I did I miss that? Or is that kind of a good answer? <laughs> Anyone? I, I guess I can talk to it a little bit only because um, I, I do have a little bit of previous experience with, with going through this and one of the big issues to tackle with this is that every plugin, every WordPress out of the box writes to the database in a certain way. And if all you're doing is that, that's one thing. But the minute you add things like WooCommerce or say an easy digital download, or they all write to the database differently. And figuring out how to do a merge based on the way that they each, um, the way their tables are created and everything and the formats that they use for their tables um, is, is part of the challenge. Um, what we found a lot of people doing is um, they, they do basically the workflow that Matt suggested, which is they take orders and then when they're ready to push, they basically pull, they basically do a maintenance window, pull that database down into the staging and then push the staging up or something like that. Um, to minimize downtime, but um, I used to be very uh, involved in the local development world, and anytime I do a presentation on the local development, um, that was kind of like the holy grail that everybody was was searching for was that that ability to merge uh, 
databases without really any downtime. Um, and I've, I've tried several different solutions out there. And, and in fact, uh, there was a time that we even had our own, but it is a pretty big issue to tackle, um, which is why nobody's really been able to come up with a great solution for it. Did, did that answer your question, Andrew? Well, it shed light on the problem that I am facing, and so it's uh, validating, I guess, if nothing else. Um, but it does help to understand, okay, well, I guess how people are doing this is by bringing their site down for maintenance. And if, if, it, if I can restate it, copying the live database down to staging and then pushing that site having been tested live um, without without taking orders in that in that time span or without accepting posts or user activity in that in that maintenance downtime is that correct i mean those might be pieces of it i think it could also be more complicated too because you know you're copying the whole database what if part of your new design has been is storing that design in the database and you can't just overwrite that like elementor stores a whole lot of stuff in the database for example so it's um yeah unfortunately i think the answer is that there's no good answer and um people have to you have to kind of figure out and understand your site well enough to know what's going on and what the best way is to either push or pull or merge or export or import or kind of put those back together um yeah it's it's a it's a it's a tough it, it's uh, as I think we've said before, one of the holy grails of like WordPress is is solving this problem. So um, it'll be uh, cool when when it's actually uh, someone actually does it. <laughs> and I just wanted to say something else. Going back to your previous question about um, you know securing uh, your site or being able to walk away from your site, um, one of the things that I thought about was uh, and and Matt, maybe you could talk to this is is um, not adding a lot of users to your WordPress site. So if you have a host that has like single sign on or something like that, that way you're not creating a bunch of administrative users. Um, that's, you know, also limiting access to your site, I think. Would you, would you agree with that, Matt? Um, I mean, you're just building up a new site and, and Andrew's words were close to them. Would you just want to be able to like, kind of leave it and walk away from it. I don't know. And unless you've been inviting a bunch of people in, I don't think that's a common thing though, you know, but hopefully that's a, a common sense thing that, I mean, one thing I would guess that some people do more often than they realize is invite someone to their site or account with admin access and then forget they're there. And that that person will no longer be working for them later or down the line or split up, but then they, you forget to go back and remove them, remove their access. And uh, um, usually that's not a problem. I guess, you know, you, you could possibly have one of those people that got added, have their account hacked, and then a hacker gets in through that other account and all that. But again, it's, it's not a, a, a frequent kind of thing. Again, with like, if you're building a new site, I, I would f focus much more on the product you know, make sure you've got decently secure hosting, but then, you know, make sure you've also got fast hosting and you've got the tools you need to, you know, just get your job done as quickly as possible too. I think, I think those are generally going to be bigger concerns than, you know, at least if your time is valuable than the security part. Any other questions? I think we're like right at 8.32 hours. So I'm not sure how this, how this runs and both Aaron and David have turned their cameras off. So I don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any other questions? No, I turned I mine off because I was, I was, yeah, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to uh, note that I don't see your uh, contact information, Matt. I, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I tried to send a message and it said I want to direct message and maybe let me try it again. Maybe it was because the uh, zoom thought I was replying to someone. It's uh, pretty easy and you could just go to our website. Just mcopala at site district. Yeah. Well, there it is. It's in there now. Okay. Thanks, Carol.
yeah, yeah. it worked. Yeah. I think that's what I have, right? Okay. Well, let me see. Can I hand this back to you guys then? You sure can. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone, especially for the feedback. Yeah, it was really good. Really good. Great presentation and, and uh, great discussion with all the questions near the end there. Really good. Thanks for taking all that time. You got. You're getting ready for travel, right? Yeah, I've, uh, I'm going to have a busy night yet tonight, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so, kind of normal. That's kind of normal for me, so I just I'm just going with it. <laughs> All right. All right. So then I think we'll wrap up here and uh, we'll be back at it on the first Tuesday of of uh, August, which will be here in no time. They always roll around fast. And now that it's only three weeks out, it'll really roll up <laughs> roll around fast. So so uh, thank you, Matt, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And you're yeah. welcome. Okay. All right. See you guys. Good night. Catch you next time. Yep.